here we go. All right, so today we're talking about the brand new On One Photo 10, which is the new name for the Perfect Photo Suite. Now, I'm probably going to say Perfect Photo Suite or the suite several times today, but if I do that, uh, I probably owe you all a dollar. It's called On One Photo 10. That's coming at the end of October today. All right, so here's kind of the top. We should tell people a little bit about, so one of the things, I had a lot of people ask me why we changed it. So one of the things is, and, and you know, anybody that's, that's kind of like been out in groups of people, everybody always called it, oh, yeah, I have on one photo, or I have on one photo nine, or I have photo 9.5. So it's like we just kind of figured why, why, why keep putting the perfect in there when nobody uses the word perfect and they just use photo or on one. Exactly. And we kind of also got rid of the, the term suite because, you know, our our legacy has really been around Photoshop plugins. And we started off in each of those little individual plugins was kind of its own little island. But over the years, we've integrated those together into one single application. It's not really a suite of individual pieces anymore. It's really one single application. So there's no real reason to call it a suite anymore either. All right. So in Photo 10, we focused on a lot of cool new changes. The first thing we did is we worked really hard to make it faster and we work really hard to make it more stable and use less memory. Now those are all uh, really important things to an end user, but they're also kind of hard to show in a webinar today. So I'm going to talk about those, but you can't really see how much more fluid a slider is or when you use a brush, how much smoother a brush is to use until you actually get it in your hands. But don't worry, it's not too far until you'll be able to use it yourself. We've also updated the user interface. We've done a lot of work in browse, which I'm going to show you today. We've made some great improvements to portrait and to enhance. We've taken the technology from perfect resize and we've allowed you to use it anywhere inside the suite. So you can crop and resize and export just about everywhere now. We've also added a great new mobile component and a lot of other cool stuff. So let's kind of dig in here and I'll walk you through some of this stuff. All right, so a couple things to keep in mind. What we're looking at today is a pre-release software. This is not the final shipping version. That won't be coming out until the end of October. So some of the features that you'll be looking at are not completely implemented yet. That means they're not done. We're still working on them. The final appearance is going to look different. So some of the dialogues, you might see some text that's misspelled or some text that's cut off, or it may not look as pretty as it will in the final version. And it may not be as fast or as stable. And if I crash today, I apologize, but it's getting pretty darn good. All right. So let's jump in and talk about a couple of those intangible things that I can't really show you in a webinar just because the screen delay is there. Again, we've spent a lot of time working on making <clears throat> all of the sliders and all of the tools a lot faster. And, you know, Mac can attest to this, a guy who works in uh, Lightroom quite a bit. It's a night and day difference in terms of uh, making adjustments in Photo 10 versus Suite 9. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say, you know, to, to everybody that's watching out there, and, and Dan, Dan will, will painfully agree, um, there were many, 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 many phone calls and screen shares and, and everything going back and forth saying, you know, guys, it's it's got to be faster. It's got to be this. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and then they'd go back and do work and come back and it's like, it's good, but it's got to be faster. So there was, a, there was a big push toward that. Yeah. The other thing, and, and one of the ways of, of doing that is to make the actual image processing algorithms faster. And we've done that by using more of the video card, what's called the GPU. It's kind of the second brain inside of your computer. By using more of the GPU, it allows us to make adjusting those sliders a lot faster. So on modern computers with good video cards, you'll see an even bigger improvement. That doesn't mean that you're not going to see improvements on an older computer as well. Or even if you have a laptop with an Intel integrated video card, those will still work and you'll still get a great experience with them. All right, so that's the stuff that I can't really show you. Let's actually get into some of the stuff that I can show you today. We're going to spend a lot of time in Browse because we actually spent a lot of time making improvements in Browse. And I'm going to show you a bunch of the cool things that I like. The first one is what we call a favorite. A favorite is a way to watch a folder and be able to keep track of everything that's in it and be able to search it and preview it faster. So I'm going to jump out of here and into Photo 10. Here we are. Over here in the upper left-hand corner, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so you guys can see this better. We've reorganized the folders pane. In the folders pane, there's a favorite section at the top, then all of your local drives, then your cloud storage right there. Now, a favorite in nine meant just keep track of this uh, folder's overall location. A favorite now means keep track of the folder and every photo inside of it. It basically is going to watch it, or if you think about Lightroom, it's going to catalog. It's going to keep track of all of those photos. Even when you launch the program for the first time, it's going to say, hey, tell us where you keep your photos. 
you just tell it that and then it'll go out and it'll watch all of those for you. The really cool thing about watching your photos is it makes browsing them a lot faster, it makes searching them a lot faster, and it unlocks a bunch of cool new features that you can't do until you kind of know where everything is. So first let's talk about the speed. So hey, here in my favorites. Yeah, hey, ahead, Dan. hey Dan, can I jump in really quick? Because mm -hmm. um, you, you made, a, a I think, an important point there, which was how it's watching and, and, and kind of cataloging things. And, and I think, you know, you, you guys have been working on it for so long that it's almost second nature to you, but um, th there's something really to be said for that because, I, I, I mean, I talk to a lot of Lightroom people, and Lightroom's great at a lot of things. Um, if I ever hear any one hiccup or any one little, you know, little problem, a roadblock with Lightroom, it's the import and catalog process. So I think you guys have done a really good job at making that seamless. It's like we're not going to move. You don't have to do anything with your photos. You just point it where you want it to go. Exactly. I think that's, that, that's an important thing. Is you, you we're, we're not moving your photos. We're not changing anything. And nothing's going on. All you do is just point it at where you keep your favorite photos and, and, and browse a look at them. Yeah, and you can still use browse just like a browser, too, so don't get us wrong. It's not turning into this, this behemoth database cataloging solution. You can still point it at your memory card. You can point it at an external drive. And it'll still browse all that stuff really fast, too. We don't want it to feel any different. We just want to be able to unlock new things that we couldn't do before. So let me show you kind of what it's like to add a favorite. All you do is you can just drag and drop a volume or a folder or anything you want into this little little spot right here, you click the plus button to add one. I've already added one for my personal images, which is actually an entire hard drive on my computer. And when I roll this down, you can see the way I organize my photos. I do it based on category, and then I have subfolders inside of these. So let's say I'm going to go to, let's go to my landscape folder, I'll go to the US, and I can either navigate in the folders here on the left, or I can just click on a folder that I'm interested in, and I can view all of the subfolders over here on the right. I can even close this entire drawer on the left and view just the folders just like that. Makes it even easier to get around. When you actually jump into one of these folders, let's say I'm gonna to go to I'm gonna to go to a big one. I'm gonna to go to my everyday folder. This is where I keep images from my little walk around camera. I'll double click and you notice there's about eighteen hundred photos in there and it loaded them all instantly and I can scroll through that entire list now. This is one of the things that you kind of lose in go to meeting is you can't see how fast this is. This is actually 100% smooth. I'm scrolling up and down this list of almost 2,000 photos with no delay at all. There's no empty thumbnails. You get them right away. Now, you, some of you guys are probably saying, well, those are probably JPEGs. That's easy to do. It's the same thing with a RAW file as well. So if I go to a folder that has RAW files in it, these are all RAWs or Photoshop files from a Canon camera. I can scroll through those just as fast, just like that. So there's no waiting for anything to load. All right, another cool thing that you can do now is you can actually view the contents of subfolders. So let's say I'm looking for pictures that I shot at the Oregon coast. So I can go to my landscapes folder, I'll go to Oregon, I'll go to my Oregon coast folder. Well, inside of that, I've got a bunch of subfolders for all the different places where I like to shoot. And if I was wanted to look at all of them at once, I'd have to go inside of each folder to see what the results are. Well, now there's a little checkbox down here at the bottom called Show Subfolder Contents. When I check that on, it takes all of the images from all of those folders and puts them into a single view. So now I'm looking at all of my pictures of the Oregon Coast, no matter what subfolder they're in. It makes it a lot faster to go through and compare different shoots or different parts of the coast. A very quick way to go through and find the photos that you're looking for. All right. Another cool thing you can do is now in the filters pane, in the search pane, you can now search those favorites. And you'll search everything about them. It'll search their file name, their path name, anything in their metadata, and find all of the photos that match. I'm a guy who doesn't do a whole lot of keywording, but I do keep my photos organized by folders. So I can just type in a folder name or a file name, and it'll find it. Let me show you. Like, I'm looking for pictures of tulips. I can just come down to the search field, and as I start to type in tulip, It'll automatically filter down the photos. And look at there, I've only typed three letters and it's already found all of my tulip pictures, just like that. Pretty simple. Now, if you are a person who does keyword, we've made some improvements to keywording as well. I'm gonna open up my browse panel on the right here. There we go. So when I click on one of these photos, it'll tell me information about it. Let's see, I'm gonna grab maybe these red ones here. 
So these have a tulip keyword on them, but I want to add the keyword red to them. So I'm just going to select all of those just by shift clicking on them. And then right here where it says add keywords, I can just start to type in the keyword I want to add. I'm going to start to type in red. You notice as soon as I hit that very first letter, R, it's automatically filtered down to all of my keywords that start with R. There we go. By the time I've typed two characters, I've automatically gotten down to just red. There we go. That's how easy it is to add keywords. It gives you kind of a great controlled vocabulary as well, so that way you can only put in the keywords that you're interested in. All right. How are we doing out there, Matt? Any good questions that we should answer? Uh, Dan, I, I sent you a message. We, uh, I can't see the questions. Uh oh <laughs> That is not good. Uh, so the questions disappeared for you? Uh, the, the, the question pane is there. It's just uh, either nobody me... asking questions, which I don't think is true, <laughs> or... Yeah, let good. me try this. Is that better? Can you see him now? Oh, yeah. All right, there we go. All right. You'll go on for a second, and then, uh, <laughs> and then I'll start looking through. All right, let's see. Lots more cool stuff in uh, in Browse. Over here on the left, there's also the Albums pane. Now, if you guys remember back in, uh, I think it was 9 or 9.5, we added the concept of an album. An album is just a collection of photos. They could live anywhere on your computer. They could live on uh, different drives or even on your network. It just gives you a place to keep track of all of them. For example, I've got one here called My Architecture Favorites, and it's all of my favorite uh, architecture pictures that I've taken, and these are in lots of different folders but I can view them all in one place. Now, the other thing I can do at the same time now is I can create what are called a smart album. It can search all of my favorites based on any metadata that I set and find all of the photos that match. For example, here's one I've created for my iPhone pictures. Let me show you what it looks like. If I go in and I look at this smart album, I can name it. I can pick what ratings, what colors, what flags it uses. I can pick a date range, and I can add any metadata criteria I want. So in this case, I was looking for any picture I took with my iPhone over the last year. So I just set the date range to this year. And then in the metadata field, I used a special one here called everything. Everything searches all the metadata. So any metadata that says iPhone. And there we go. It goes out and finds 880 pictures that I shot with my iPhone last year. Just like that. You can make it more complicated. Let me go in and I'll show you. Let's say I want to find everything that I shot with my iPhone, but I only want to find ones where the aperture was at uh, 2.8. There we go. So these are my 2.8 iPhone images. Oh, well, looks like I didn't shoot any of 2.8 last year. I think the iPhone's actually a fixed aperture that's smaller than that. All right, now, a couple more cool things to show you. Uh, this one's easier to talk about in a slide to start. So we talked about smart albums. The next one I want to talk to you guys about is Photovia. Uh, Photovia is actually one of our products that some of you guys have probably never heard of. It's actually let you take photos that you've published in Lightroom and make them appear on your iPhone or your iPad. That way you've got a great way to carry your portfolio of photos around with you. It also gives you the ability to synchronize metadata between the two. So I can come back from a shoot, I can sit on my couch and view all my photos on my iPad, and I can go through and I can rate and label those without having to sit at my computer. We're now bringing that same photo via technology that we've built for Lightroom, and we're putting it into Browns. So you'll be able to take either albums or smart albums or your favorites and publish them so you'll be able to see them on your iPhone or your iPad. It's super easy to do, too. All you do is you just right-click on what you want to share. So in this case, I want to share this album of my architecture favorites. I right-click and I would select Publish with Photovia. Now, I've already got it published, so it would say Unpublish. All you do is just select Publish, and in the background, it'll automatically build versions and communicate all that information up to the Photovia servers, and then on your phone or your iPad, it kind of looks like this. Here's those same photos that I published from my desktop in Browse. I can view which computers I've published them from. I can dig into what folders they live in, I can zoom in on those photos. I can change their ratings and labels. I can view metadata about the photo. And of course, I can share and edit that photo on my iOS device, just like I would on any other photo that's on my iPhone or iPad. So it's a really great way to carry your favorite photos around with you. All right, 
couple more things I want to show you. Obviously, you've seen a taste of the new user interface that we're working on. You can also now share your photos in Browse, or actually in any module, you get to select a photo that you want to share. Then down here in the bottom right-hand corner, you click on the Share icon, and then you select how you want to share it. Any sharing service that you have set up on your computer, whether it's Mail or Twitter or Facebook or Flickr, you just select the one you want. Let's say I want to share this to Facebook. I just select that. It'll automatically build a JPEG. So in this case, this is a raw file. I can't send a raw file to Facebook. It'll automatically build the right size JPEG for me, and it'll open up the Facebook Share dialog, just like that. And I can pick where it goes and who can see it and add in a description, hit post, and it posted that photo to Facebook for me, just like that. Now, right now, that's a Mac-only feature. It'll be coming to our Windows customers in the early part of next year. Now, let's say I want to share more than just a single photo. I need to share a lot of photos. Let's say I want to take all of these architecture pictures and I want to put them onto my website. So I can just select all of these and I'll use the new export feature. Export is the replacement for batch and it's kind of a grown up version of batch. I can just right click, select export or go to file export and it'll open the new export drawer on the right. Here we are. So in export, you can pick the size you want those photos exported to. Let's say I'm going to make these for my website. So I'm going to say I want them to be 1,000 pixels on their long edge. I'll change this to pixels and 1,000. And I only need 96 pixels per inch for my resolution. I can pick what algorithm is used to resize those. So a lot of the power from Perfect Resize lives in this export pane. I can use the On One Resize, which is Perfect Resize, or if you've been with us a really long time, Genuine Fractals, or I have other algorithms that I can pick from as well that are tuned to whether you're making small JPEGs or you're working on a landscape or you're working on a portrait photo. I'm going to use that Genuine Fractals method. I'm going to turn off a couple of these guys I don't need. I can pick the file type that I want. I'm going to save these as a JPEG in sRGB. I can pick where they're going to get saved to, what happens when I'm done saving them, and I can choose how I want to name them. So right now it would take all 29 of these files, which live in different places on my computer, and it's going to make the same size JPEG for me and put it all in the same spot so it's easy for me to publish to my blog or to my website. So let's say I want to add some sharpening to it. I can click on the little plus button at the top, and I can add some sharpening. I'll pick screen medium sharpening, and maybe I want to add a watermark. I want to put my logo on these as well, so I'll select the watermark option. And from the watermark option, I can pick a file I want. I can pick how big it's going to appear in my image, where I want to put it, what its opacity is, so I can really tune it to be just what I want. And then I can save this as a preset, so I can use it over and over again. Now, you can do this with many photos, or you can do it with a single photo. Let's say I have one photo, and I want to prepare it for printing on canvas. So I'm just going to reset my export pane here. And let's say I want to make this a 16 by 20 gallery wrap. So I can just go into photographic, select 16 by 20. And rather than being a JPEG, I want to save it as a Photoshop file. And I want to add gallery wrap. So I just, from the pop up the top, select gallery wrap. It gives me a preview of it. I can pick which gallery wrap method I want how thick I want those wings to be, all the same things that I would do inside a perfect resize, I can now do in any module using the export option, just like that. All right, I'm going to pause here for a second and see if we have some questions we can answer. Yeah, we have uh, we have a lot. <laughs> so what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll some quick ones I can run through, Dan, and then some of them I'll throw over to you. Um, will 9.5 be obsolete now with no updates? Uh, expected rollout date, Dan? We will be out at the end of October. I believe it's the 26th or 27th of October. There was actually a question in there, Matt, that you had and someone asked about 9.5, whether it becomes obsolete or not, and it does not. Yeah. 9.5 will continue to work, and you can keep it on your computer, and we will actually uh, continue to update it for a, a short period of time after Photo 10 comes out. So, for example, I know that in uh, probably in the January or uh, December timeframe, there will actually be an update for 9.5 as well. Okay. 
Um, let's see, will there be a raw processor? If yes, how will it work? Uh, there will not be a raw processor. Enhance, uh, here's what I can tell you. Um, and again, this is one of those ones that, that Dan, Dan, was, Dan and, and the dev team were just champions on is um, the, I would go back on, especially you know, exposure, highlights, and shadows. I think those are the big things that, that raw processors have a lot of control over. Um, we really went through quite a bit there, and um, it's not a raw processor yet, but I can tell you that you can push the exposure, shadows, and highlights pretty darn far and enhance. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a nice little module that you can jump over to and make some changes without having to jump back to light. Yeah, I think of it more like almost like camera raw in Photoshop. You know, when you actually open a file up, you still have the option to to make pretty big changes, but it's not actually making those changes to the raw file. It's making it to the new file that you're going to work on. That's that's actually a great analogy. I got you. I'm going to steal that one, Dan. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, can browse replace Lightroom without losing functions? Um, browse is not Lightroom. Browse is literally just a browser. It's got a lot of great things. The the way that I can tell you I use it is. There's just quick, if there, you know. Sometimes I get back from a photo shoot and I, I just very very quickly want to jump in and look at the photos. Then browse is going to be a great place for that. Lightroom is still is still going to be the cataloging, um, and it's still you know to me Lightroom is still the raw editor. Exposure, shadows, highlights, noise reduction, lens corrections, calibration, things like that. Those are Lightroom tasks, and that hasn't changed yet. So so I'm still going to use Lightroom for those things. And um, and jump over to the photo suite for retouching with portraits, adding filters, effects, things like that. Uh, what's the difference between Lightroom Collections and Photo 10 albums? Nothing. They're the same, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, once on one 10 is downloaded, is it necessary to keep previous suites, or can they be deleted uh, once you know afterwards? Uh, Dan. You, you actually have the option. When you install it, by default, it's going to leave your old versions behind, but when you install it, there's also a little checkbox that you can turn on that will remove old versions as well. So it's really up to you. A lot of our customers like to install the new one, play with it, get used to it, and then they'll go back later, and they'll uninstall the old version. It doesn't require that the old one be there. Yeah. Um, all right. I'll take a few more, and then we'll, uh, we'll let Dan jump on. Uh, are Kindle de devices supported? No. Uh, how about Android? So a lot of questions on Android when um, when Photovia came up. So initially, I mean, currently when we uh, ship Photovia, it will only be for iOS devices. Depending on the feedback that we get from customers and the desire for, we may create an Android version in the future. Cool. Uh, Dan, will it run on a Surface Pro 3? It will, actually. That's my, my Windows test machine is a Surface Pro 3. Yeah, remember, you have one in your office, right? Uh, do keywords transfer to Lightroom? Yes. Any of the metadata that you add in Perfect Photo will show up in Lightroom and vice versa. So especially if you make a change in Lightroom and you make sure that uh, metadata gets embedded back in the photo, it'll get picked up in uh, on one photo as well. All right. And uh, we'll take one more, Dan. Uh, I think I can answer this one. How can we, and because there's a few questions on this, how can we integrate Browse with the Lightroom library without a lot of duplication of effort. Um, so the way that I use it is I get back from that photo shoot and I just want to look at my photos. You know, I just I drop them onto my desktop. I don't think I'm alone in this. You know, I drop them on my desktop and I just want to very quickly browse through. I don't want to import. I don't want to figure out where I'm going to put them. I just want to look through. Drop them on the desktop. I'll browse through. As I browse through, if I hit the number five for five star, then that'll label that photo as a five star photo. That gets put into the metadata of the photo, and from there you can just right click and you can import that entire folder into Lightroom, and it'll actually pick up all those five stars. So yes, it, it, there's no duplication of effort because now those five stars go right over into Lightroom, and you can start your organizing process from there. Exactly. All right, that's uh, that'll take care of a few for now, Dan. If you want to continue cool. on. I see uh, two more I'm going to answer real quick. Uh, one is a question about will your presets transfer over. Any presets you've created in an older version of the Perfect Photo Suite will be picked up automatically and imported into Photo 10. And a question about uh, Photovia, what does it require for a service? Is there a monthly fee? The cool thing about Photovia is it actually uses your storage service. It uses either Dropbox or Google Drive 
to store all of the information and synchronize the data back and forth. So there's no additional plan to sign up for, there's no monthly fee, there's no creative cloud or anything like that. It just uses the cloud storage service that you already use. All right, so let's jump in. Matt talked a little bit about Enhance. I want to show you some of the improvements that we've made there as well. I'm just going to grab a photo out of an album here, and I'll just click on Enhance over here in the Module Selector. So the Module Selector has moved over here to the right-hand side, and the tools will still appear over on the left. So I'm just going to click on Enhance to open this photo up. This happens to be a raw file from, oh, what is it, a 6D it looks like. Here we are. Presets live on the left. I'm going to close that up just to give us a little bit more preview area to work with. So I'll just slide it out of the way. And there's our photo. I'm going to start off. I'm going to grab the retouch brush. And I'm going to get rid of this little piece of dust that was on my sensor. Little spot I missed. There we go. And there's this one little branch that kind of hangs down up here that bugs me a little bit. So I'm going to get rid of it too. There we go. The longer I look at it, I'm sure I'll find more things I want to get rid of. All right, so the big changes we've made in here are in the color and tone adjustment pane. We've decided to make those controls have a broader range of effect and to work more like what you would be uh, used to in a raw processor. For example, brightness is now exposure, and it affects a much larger range and is way faster. So as I move this to the right, it can get way brighter or to the left, way darker. Now, again, one of the things that you guys can't see over a GoToMeeting because there's kind of a delay is just how fast and smooth this adjustment is. It's pretty much real time as I slide that back and forth. We've also made some big improvements to the shadows and highlights algorithms. Not only are they faster, they have a broader range and they also work in both directions. So in the past, we used to think of shadows as only lightening the shadows. Well, sometimes you might want to darken the shadows. You might want to add more contrast and you want to add it to only a certain part of the image. So I can grab that shadow slider. And of course, if I drag it to the right, it's going to open up the shadows and bring up more detail. But if I bring it to the left, I can darken the shadows and add more drama. Same thing with the highlights. I can bring highlights down to recover more information in the highlights and the waterfall, or I can crank it up to make that water smoother and whiter. More white, I should say. And of course, the whites and black sliders work the same way. They work in both directions now as well. So I can bring down the white point, or I can bring up the black point. So let me start from scratch, and I'll show you kind of how I would adjust this photo. Yeah. I'm going to hold down the J key on my keyboard. That'll show me my clipping. You can do the same thing if you go to your histogram view and turn on the little clipping indicators up here. And I'll set my black point first. So I want to set it so that I have just a tiniest little bit of black. That's way too much black. So anything that is pure blue is just the edge of pure black. So I want to adjust it so I have just a little bit of real black. There we go. I'll probably do the same thing with the whites. So whites is a little bit more subjective. It kind of depends on your preference. So I'm going to bring the whites up a little bit, but I want to bring it all the way up because I'll lose all the detail in the whites. So I'm going to bring my whites up just a little bit to clean those up. Then I'll adjust my highlights and shadows. I'm going to bring my shadows up to open up the shadows a little bit. I'll adjust the highlights to taste. I kind of want that water to be nice and smooth. So I'm going to actually, rather than recovering detail, I'm going to remove detail by brightening my highlights. There we go. And then kind of the last thing I just might be the overall exposure just a little. There we go. I'll bring my detail up a little bit. And now we'll tune the color. In the color, there's now presets for different white balance settings. So I happen to know that I photographed this on a cloudy day. So I can just pick the cloudy day option. I can always use the auto option or I can fine tune those temperature and tint by hand or use the gray clicker to click it as well. I think I want Maybe just a little bit more magenta in there. There's now a saturation slider on as well as a vibrant slider, so I could go all the way to black and white if I want to. Or I could just use vibrance just to bring up those subtle colors and make them a little bit stronger. We'll add a little vignette to it. And let's take a look at the before and the after. There's the before. And there's the after. Just like that. So just by adjusting a few sliders here in Enhance, I was able to improve my photo, bring it back to what I saw in my mind's eye in the camera when I was standing there that day. This is really where just about everybody starts with their photos, making these kinds of adjustments before they actually go into something like effects to go in and add a more stylized look to it. And with today's style, a lot of times you may just do all of your work here in Enhance and never even go to effects. All right. Anything you want to add, Matt? 
Uh, not on that one. That's uh, I mean, you explained it really well. Um, you, we're getting a question, one question a lot, and that is, do presets um, in 9, 9.5 show up or upgrade or update to 10? Yes, they do. So anything that you created in 9 and actually 8 and 7, uh, when the installer for 10 runs, it detects those presets and it automatically copies them over to Photo 10's preset folder. So all of your old presets will be there and you'll be able to continue to use those. Cool. Yeah, that was a, that was a big one. <laughs> no, that's definitely one we got to make sure we, everybody can keep their presets. Yeah. Put a lot of work into those. All right, now let's take a peek at, let's see where I'm at, if I get caught up here. We talked about being able to use resize everywhere. We talked about the new uh, export module, which replaces uh, batch for batch processing, or even just for exporting a single photo. We've talked about the cool enhancements to exposure and tone controls inside of Enhance. Those enhancements have also been made inside of Effects as well. All right, now let's talk about Portrait. We've made a couple really cool improvements to Portrait that make it so much better to use. I'm going to grab a Portrait image, and I'm just going to click on the Portrait module. Now, a photo like this where the subject is shot laying down would not have worked in the old version of Perfect Portrait. It would not be able to detect a face that was rotated so much, so we've improved the face detection so it can now detect a rotated face. And we've added a new way for you to interact and tell us where the eyes and the mouth are. This is kind of for two reasons. One, it makes the eye mouth detection more accurate, and it now gives you the ability to skip things you don't want. So let's say I open this photo and all I want to do is retouch the skin. I don't want to do anything to the eyes and the mouth. I can just skip those areas and I don't have to adjust them at all. Or maybe I only want to do the eyes and I don't want to do anything with the mouth. Or maybe there's hair over one of the eyes. Or it's a profile photo and I'm only interested in working in one eye. You now have full control over what areas of the face are actually going to be retouched. So click on the face you want to work on. It's going to zoom in. And now what we do is we start by clicking on the areas we actually want to retouch. So I'm going to click on the left eye, the right eye, and then the corners of the mouth. If I wanted to skip one of those, let's say I didn't want to do the mouth, rather than clicking, I'd just hit the space bar or click the skip button, and I'd be able to skip adding those. So there we go. Now it knows just where the eyes and the corners of the mouth are, so it makes it a lot more accurate when it adds those eye and mouth control points. So you can see it's put those in. And it's done a much better job of placing them. You know, in the past, you might get an eyeball in her forehead if someone's laying down. We've also made it way faster to adjust these control points. So even though you do a good job of trying to set those initially, you probably have to go through and manually adjust a couple of those points. It's way faster to adjust them. You don't have to wait between points. There's no bonks or beeps while you move things around. We've also yeah, added this handy little... I was gonna say it does. It picks up your curve. I mean, it's 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 hard to see on the go-to meeting, but that's that's one area that I know you guys put a lot of effort in, and it's really quick and easy to adjust them. Yeah, yeah, it's way better. You know, for me, a lot of times I don't I don't retouch the mouth at all uh, unless it's an open mouth smile and I want to whiten the teeth. So I just skip adding the mouth altogether. So it's a lot faster. You really pick just the stuff that's important to you. With this handy little palette here. I can now click Adjust Skin. I can see just the skin area. makes it easy for me to adjust and remove things that I don't want to get smoothing on, like maybe there's a little bit of her hair, and maybe sometimes people's eyebrows might get smoothed out. I can make sure those areas don't get any retouching. And now when I move my mouse outside of the preview, it automatically turns all that stuff off, all those controls and all that chrome disappears, and I can see just my results. I don't have to hit that hide controls button any longer. So it's much easier to see just what my results are going to look like. Let me make a couple adjustments here. I might turn up the smoothing just a little bit. We'll add a little color correction. Bring a little bit more warmth back into her skin. And maybe we'll bring up the whitening on the eyes just a little. There we go. Let's look at our before and our after. So there's before. And there's after just like that. So much faster to get great looking results in portrait. You don't have to uh, adjust those control points as much. You can pick just the areas that you want and adjusting the sliders are way faster. Now it actually uses the same engine that affects and enhance you. So you actually get the same kind of performance and the same kind of results you get in those other modules here inside of portrait. All right. 
questions out there, Matt? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, let's say, uh, so how does version 10 handle raw files? Is it through Apple? Is it, what does it do? So when you open a raw file in 10, if you're working on a Mac, it will use the uh, Mac's built-in raw processing engine to open it unless it's a raw file that isn't supported by the Mac. So if it's an older one and they haven't bothered to add support for it, then it uses a different raw processing library, which is the same raw processing library that we use on Windows. So when you open a file on Windows, it uses a different raw library that we've created. Gotcha. Um, is Photo 10 compatible with something like DxO, Optics, or Capture One? So you can certainly use it as an external editor to any application that supports an external editor protocol. So if you can go in and say, open my photo with this, you can certainly do, do it that way. Uh, yeah. Same thing you can do inside a browse. In browse, you can configure other editors. Like, I still use Photoshop a lot, so I've gone in and it'll automatically detect Photoshop in Lightroom for me. So in browse, I can click on a photo, right click, and send it right to Photoshop if I want to. I think, uh, I think one of the ways that you can also kind of handle that is... Is, is basically, you know, all, all these other apps will, will handle a third party, uh, a third party app to, that, that they can work with. And like Dan said, you're kind of, you're kind of editing it as a third party. Um, on one is standalone. So it's like you could use anything you wanted and then open that image inside of Photo 10 and edit it because you, you, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily rely on another program. There are Lightroom versions and there are Photoshop versions and it does plug right into those, but um, other than that, it's also standalone, so you, you can do anything you want with it. Uh, let's right, see. The cool thing about being a standalone is it lets you open just about uh, any kind of photo imaging file. So TIFF and JPEG and PNG and Photoshop and uh, PSD, a Photoshop large format or RAW from like 250 different cameras can all be opened and can all be saved into whatever the, of those formats you want. And you can even save it as a smart photo so that your adjustments are re-editable. You can go back and re-edit your settings, re-edit your masks and everything at a later date. Yeah. Uh, one more question here, Dan. This is this is a good one because I think, you know, you'll recall we, we ran into things like this during testing and all that. Um, the question, because you're using more GPU video card functions, um, will my three-year-old ThinkPad uh, and video card work? And, and I know you probably can't answer exactly what video cards will work. I'm not expecting that. But I think there's, like, we, we were talking that sometimes because of all these retina screens and because of all this, sometimes, sometimes older equipment will actually work a little bit faster than some of these newer, these newer laptops and these newer, you know, the pl platforms we have with these crazy high pixel retina screens. Yeah, yeah, there's actually, there's a couple things there. So uh, to give you an idea, the computer that I'm using to demo on today, and these are actual raw files you see me opening, is a uh, 2010 uh, MacBook Pro. Uh, so it's, you know, it's not a, not a spring chicken either. Uh, it will continue to work on anything that supports OpenGL 2. That's kind of the minimum requirement. And if you have a newer machine, it will take advantage of more video RAM or more of the higher end processing capabilities of those cards, but it's not a requirement. It'll just be faster in those cases. And kind of what Matt was alluding to, when you have more pixels on the screen, when you have a retina display or a high DPI display, there's so many uh, pixels on the screen that could actually be slower than a smaller, older screen like my laptop is. So still get good performance on a Retina machine. My other machine is an iMac uh, with a new Retina screen. It's like a 5,000 pixel display, and that's what I do most of my work in testing on, and it works just fine there too. Cool. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm. All right. So what else you got? So for next week... We have some other cool stuff we're going to show you as well. It's not ready quite to show you yet, but you'll see all of the cool changes that we're working on in effects. I'll talk about a little bit of them, but you won't be able to see them until next week's episode. So we've recreated uh, the way that presets and categories work, making it easier to find the genre of effect that you're looking for. We've also improved the way that you stack uh, filters on top of each other, and we've added a cool new ability to actually adjust the blending mode and even mask an entire preset. So now you can add a preset 
and paint the entire preset in just where you want rather than having to go from filter layer to filter layer to make those adjustments. Plus you pick up all of those user interface and performance improvements that you've seen through everything else. The other thing that we've done is we've taken the guts from black and white and we've moved it inside of effects. So you can still create all of the exact looks. You actually have all of the same presets that black and white had, but it now works inside of the effects engine. The cool part about this is you can now mask that entire preset in or out, and you can also add other filters to your stack. So one of the common requests we had was, gosh, I really wish I could use dynamic contrast, but I have to do that in effects and then go to black and white. Well, now you can insert dynamic contrast into your black and white workflow. So you have a lot more control over how your black and white conversions work, still creating the exact same looks that you could in black and white in the past. So we'll cover about all that stuff and some other cool new stuff for next week. All right. Let's cool see if we got stuff, time man. For yeah, any more questions out there? Uh, here, let me uh, jump in and take a look. There's there's a lot coming. I think what we'll, <laughs> what we'll end up doing is either um, we can just post them to on1.com. We have everybody's email who who kind of jumped in today, and we can always uh, we can always send a follow up email because there's a lot of questions in here, and um, it'd probably be easier to write them all out. But uh, so we have got the Android questions uh, for people that jumped in on the upgrade, uh, asking if there's an upgrade price. So the upgrade and the full price is both eighty nine dollars, which is cheaper than any price was last year. So um, some, somebody asked about file open options, like as a copy, as the original, non destructive. Yeah, so when you when you open a file, you have the choice of either working on the original, if it's one that you can actually edit, if it's a Photoshop file or a TIFF or a JPEG, you can just open it and save right over the top of it if you want to, or you can edit a copy. And when you make the copy, you have the option of the file type you want it to be. So you could start with a raw file, and I want to save a PSD is a very common way of working. Uh, that's actually the way that I typically do it. And when I do that, I use the smart photo option so that I can always go back and re-edit my settings again. So I might start with a RAW, open it as a smart photo, go to enhance, do my basic adjustments, then go to effects and add my stylized look to it. I can then go back at any point in time later and change the settings of the sliders that I use in enhance or effects. You know, sometimes I'll come back later and look at it and say, gosh, I kind of really kind of overdid that. I used that HDR look a little too strong or my dynamic contrast was too strong. Nobody I does that. Back and I can find that nobody does that. So. <laughs> um, uh, another question, uh, I can answer this one. Is there a reason to buy now versus the end of October? Uh, so yeah, there's there's pre-order specials that won't be part of uh, what the end of October. So there's, um, you get a family license and you get this whole huge training bundle that I'm going to be recording for it. Um, and then you also get three free issues of the upcoming uh, brand new e-magazine called On One Photo Magazine. So that's kind of the the pre-order incentive. So of course you could wait till the end of October. The price won't the you know the price won't get cheaper or nothing like that. You'll just lose the pre-order stuff. Yeah. And yeah, so some aspects are going to be tutorial. I'm sorry, Dan. Go ahead. I said, you know, it's definitely worth getting it. I think the, the 10 for 10, that ultimate uh, training bundle that Matt is working on is going to be hugely valuable to uh, to 10 customers to get the most out of it and really learn about all the new stuff. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. So talk about that. Um, we'll... Will on one ten be showing up under Photoshop CSS or Photoshop's filters plus automate? So that's actually a change that we're making for ten is we're actually moving it to the filter menu. For years it's been uh, living in the automate menu, which has always been confusing for folks to find it. And uh, back in the old days there were certain functions that we needed that we couldn't get unless it was an automate plug-in, we don't really have to deal with some of those issues now that we're a standalone application, so we've chosen to put them back in the filter menu. It makes them easier to find, it makes them behave more like a normal uh, Photoshop plug-in, uh, doing things like remembering your last use settings when you launch it and things like that. And it may, we're still working on this, so I can't promise that this will happen, it will uh, also probably make it easier to use in other applications like Affinity Photo or Corel uh, PaintShop Pro, other things that support Photoshop plugins. Cool. All right, man. I think that takes care of uh, 
There's still other questions, but a lot are, uh, and I saw a couple support questions in there. Um, best thing you do, if something's, some, yeah, I think there were two or three people that said they have a problem with 9.5 and they don't, they're afraid to get 10 because they're not sure. Best thing you can do is just uh, email uh, customer support. If you go to onone.com slash support, um, they're really good about getting back to everybody. So just uh, shoot them an email, and, and, and if you're having problems, they're, they're the best place to take care of you to, to, to see if there's anything wrong. Yeah, and this, the support guys have, have made some great changes to the support website recently. There's a, a new engine for uh, searching for answers. Uh, like 90% of people who come can actually answer their question just by using the search field and finding existing knowledge base articles that solve the, the question for them. Yeah. Um, and there's also online uh, chat now, so rather than having to send an email and wait, uh, if their chat guys are ready, you can actually just uh, chat with them directly through your web browser. Perfect. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of questions that people must have missed at the beginning. Yes, it's being recorded, and uh, it'll be up on the On1 website. Uh, it's usually under the training category, right, Dan? Yep, it'll be in the, I believe it is the training category. Uh, it may actually be on the homepage as well. It should be up here in a couple of hours, though. We have to encode it and upload it. So if you miss something, it'll be up there very soon. Sounds good. Well, Dan, right. thank you. And, and, I mean, on behalf of me and hopefully people that are watching, just pass on everything to the, to the development team because um, I can attest that, that they've been working around the clock on this stuff. I will definitely do that. I thanks everybody for their uh, support and having your time today to uh, to watch and learn. All right. Well, I thank everybody for coming. And again, uh, same time next week, and we'll dig into effects quite a bit more and show you all the cool new things we're working on for perfect effects. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a good thanks, day. Thanks, everybody. Bye.